What's up, everybody? It's Stephen Williams, founder and president of CreditRepairShop.com. And on this video, we're going to be talking about several different things with the Equifax settlement. If you find uh, that you want to take advantage of uh, what they're offering in their settlement, and if you were harmed or your credit was harmed or anything uh, because of the breach that they had, we're going to talk about what you can do on those. And then I'm going to talk about some of the other companies that also have this available uh, where they had the breaches and, uh, and you they have remedies uh, to help you either with uh, credit monitoring and stuff like that. We're going to talk about uh, uh, my um, It wasn't a client. It was a person that watched a YouTube video and then she reached out to me and I told her exactly what to do. And I'm going to tell you the result of what happened with that. Uh, in, and as always, we talk about debt collection and credit repair on my videos. We're going to go into some details about what you can do if you find yourself in a situation where you have debt collectors coming after you and things that you can do to repair your credit at the same time. So first, let's start off with uh, Equifax. If you hadn't seen it in the news, uh, they uh, settled uh, or they proposed a settlement with a settlement of uh, what I've seen several different numbers, 500 million all the way up to 700 million. And uh, one of the things that they're offering in the settlement with Equifax is that they're giving 10 years of credit monitoring service services, but it's only for Equifax. So the credit monitoring service is only going to be for Equifax. It's not going to be for the other bureaus. So if you, what I suggest and tell people to do, and this is what I do too for myself, and it's, it, you know, you have Credit Karma and those ones out there, but those are not really uh, a standard credit monitoring service. You need to have a paid one because it's going to give you all the information that you're going to need, especially if you're looking to repair your credit. Um, there's a link below this video if you want to go to the one that we recommend or you can you know seek out your own but you need to get all three reports you need to know what's going on, on all three reports at all times but Equifax in the settlement uh, they're offering 10 years of credit monitoring services and then for anyone that was harmed though the, uh, like if you someone actually got your credit and they used it uh, you're gonna have to contact the law firm that is handling the uh, the uh, the injuries or you know the, that's handling the case and find the one that's handling it in your area so you can submit your claim to them and you know and I don't know how that's gonna shake out uh, in my own personal experience when stuff like this happens it's usually better to hire yourself an attorney or to submit your own information to to them not being an attorney submitted straight to uh, the company that did the harm and some of the times they'll their attorney reach out to you and say can we propose a settlement directly with you and not include it with the uh, proposed settlement that has happened before and I've seen that happen uh, with clients uh, you know so if you if you found that you did have some some uh, fraud on your credit uh, you're going to need to fill out an ID theft kit and you can get that from the FTC and you fill it out completely. You, there's some things that you can have to get signed, uh, but, and, you know, just to prove that you are who you are, even though the person that put stuff on your credit reports wasn't you, they were able to get your information a lot easier than you're able to fix the information about yourself, uh, on your credit reports. But, Go to the FTC website for ID theft, download that information, uh, those forms, fill it out, send it in to each of the bureaus. You should be able to get everything taken care of. If you don't have the time to do it, don't know how to do it, don't want to, uh, you know, you want to have someone do it, well, obviously my company can handle that for you. And there's a link below on uh, to how to contact us uh, to get that done for you. Other uh, companies that ran into problems was Chase. Bank of America, uh, Experian even had some problems. Uh, I think that across the board, it seems like every company has had a breach. My medical uh, health insurance company, uh, someone that they had were providing 
some type of services where it had a breach that leaked over and was able to get some information from our health care provider. So, I mean, it's just like wide open. You would think that people are just walking around with briefcases and, you know, they're just like, here, here is the information on these people in there. I don't know. Uh, and then a company that I buy my watches from, uh, it's an online company. They were breached and they sent me a letter uh, in the mail the other day and I opened it up and I was like, what, what is this? You know, they usually send an advertisement, but this was just a plain letter just saying that please watch your credit uh you know and and if something came on there uh let us know uh that we apologize we had a breach uh with our with your with the personal data of all of the people that have bought watches from us so i was like man this is just uh breaking all over the place with people that are either somehow i think what's happening is that there's connections with payment systems and when they get into a payment system, they're able to kind of backtrack their way into unprotected vendors that are using the payment system. Because it's got to just, you know, it can't be just that easy for someone to just break in and get our personal information. Now, uh, with my YouTube viewer that, that reached out to me last week, I think it was Friday, she reached out to me. She had to go to court this yesterday, this past Tuesday, on the uh, 23rd, July 23rd. And uh, so I, she told me about her situation. She said that she was on disability, wasn't able to work. They were coming after her. I think it was for like 3200 bucks, something like that. And um, it was a credit card company. And I said, well, this is what you need to do. You need to, number one, notify them by phone, call them up and notify them of your situation. Uh, and I said, depending on what, how, the, if they purchase a debt or if they're collecting it for the original creditor, the credit card company, you, you, you're going to have two possible outcomes. Uh, they might just say, we're not going to, we're going to cease all collection activity because they know that if you're on disability and you're not working it, they're not going to be able to get the money. Uh, or number two, they could send it back to the original creditor if they hadn't purchased a debt. So if it's a debt collection company and they didn't purchase the debt, then the debt collection company, usually what they'll do is they'll just choose to send it back to the original creditor. I've even seen that also where they'll send it back to a debt collection company that assigned the debt to them to try to collect because they were in a certain area where the individual that owed the debt uh, collection lived in. So, but what happened was from that phone call, they notified her that they were going to send the debt back to the credit card company. Uh, that was, right there was a relief to her, but I told her, don't just take their word for it. The next step is I want you to draft a letter and I want you to send it to them stating what the agent on the phone, the debt collection agent told you on the phone, you need to send that to them and you need to send a copy of that to the court, to the judge that was on the summons or the clerk that was on the summons on uh, the uh, summons uh, letter that was sent to you. And if possible, see if you could have it faxed to that uh, clerk's, to that judge's clerk. She was able to do that. She was able to get that over to them and she was able to also submit that letter again to the debt collector just to reiterate what she had talked to the agent on the phone, the debt collection agent on the phone and what that individual had said. Uh, so she, so and the reason why I had her do that is because I wanted her to make sure that she was covered because she still had a court date and they did not tell her not to show up to court. And that was a trap because if she wouldn't have showed up to court, Everything that they talked about wouldn't have happened. They would have got a default judgment. So she showed up in court. Soon as they called her name, they just said dismiss. The, the attorney that was there for that debt collector said dismiss. She was able to walk out of court. But something that she had told me, and I had said that I talked about this in other videos, and I told her this, is that a lot of people 
don't show up and they just get default judgments. They don't even uh, try to uh, initiate their rights on debt collections, on debt collectors. And it makes it harder for them to repair their credit when they let this these types of default judgments go in when they wouldn't have went in. And I had even prepared her for things that she need to ask for with the attorney, the debt collection attorney. I had told her, uh, okay, we know what what uh, they told us. You prepared those letters, get, giving them to the court. But what if you go in the court and they want to argue they're like they just lied to you and they just want they want to argue and I had prepared her for that and what in what I had told her to do was to ask for validation of all of the debt ask for validation of if this debt collector is collecting it for the original creditor or did they purchase it or you know the whole paper trail of how they got that debt and how they're legally able to come after her for the debt. That means that they got to prove all the charges, everything that was done on that card. Uh, obviously, it didn't get to that. That didn't never happen. She didn't have to worry about that. But uh, that I had also had her prepare for that. But when she was called up, he just said the, the attorney for the debt collector said dismissed. And what I'm thinking is going to happen, it went back to the original creditor the credit card company they're going to do a for debt forgiveness and they're going to file a 1099c uh debt for in their forgiving the debt they're going to file that with the irs and they're going to have the irs is going to consider that amount of money that they file as income now so what i the next step that uh she needs to do when you get that 1099c form from the IRS is that you need to make sure that that is not stacked with a whole bunch of BS fees because they could send the 1099 for ten thousand dollars. They could say that it was all these fees and court costs were on there when uh, it was dismissed, so no court cost or anything could be passed on to her because you know she, the whole thing was dismissed. It, it, no one, uh, they did not win any type of judgment or any type of. Uh, court case so uh these companies they're snakes so what they'll try to do is they'll beef up the 1099 c form with a higher amount send it to the irs they write it off on their taxes get more of a write-off on their taxes and then the, the uh uh individual is stuck with trying to figure out what to do with this 1099 c and they don't even know their rights that they can challenge that 1099 1099 c for the amount that they filled in on that and then, uh, the, you know, they're, but they're going to consider whatever it is, they're going to consider it as income. So you have to be prepared to have a higher tax amount. Or if you were expecting a refund, that refund could be chopped away because they're going to add on additional income to you. Uh, all right. So that that was uh, the outcome from that with dealing with that debt collection company. And uh, the next phase for her would be to repair her credit using that information from that dismissal uh, she could use that information to repair her credit uh, to show that that item number one is not even going to be able to be on a report because it is showing inaccurate now due to what happened in the court uh, in that court case now I had some uh, people respond to me about the real estate I just want to briefly go into how I purchased the property because I kind of told you the, the, the some of what happened with that uh, property and then uh, I had uh, didn't but I didn't talk about how to buy it and I think that some of the people were probably wanted to know like okay you told us that you got it you paid for it and what happened during the time you own it and then that you sold it and made all this money but how did you find that property because um that when you're a, an investor the way that my wife and i did it we were very active investors we would go and look at properties we would uh we would i don't what well, we we would go and look at properties there was a way that we were able to go to properties without having to have an agent with us but you're usually gonna have to have an agent to go look into a property unless you are an agent but we would go look at the properties and then if we uh 
wanted to put an offer on them, we would, but what we found was the best way to find properties because if you're looking like it's going to be hard to find them if you're looking in the newspaper looking on the mls and all that those people are jumping on those real quick uh and this kind of goes into what i'm going to talk about at the end of this video about the connection like the knowledge that i'm giving you you never know when that dot is going to be connected to when you're going to use it when I was uh, 17 years old, uh, I learned about real estate with a, it was a Mexican guy that taught, I, I don't remember his name, but he was a Mexican guy. He taught me step by step how to invest in real estate. I had paid him, uh, I think it was like a thousand dollars. Like I got some money from my grandmother when I had graduated from high school and uh, it was 2,500 bucks. and. I wanted to be a real estate investor. Back then I used to watch those shows on TV and I was like, I want to be in real estate. So, but I had got the programs on TV and they were like, they really wasn't what they were make, cut out to be. But uh, the Spanish guy, I don't know how I came across him, but I paid him a thousand dollars and I sat, literally sat across from his desk. He recorded, <laughs> it was crazy. He recorded, we had, he gave me a workbook and he recorded everything uh where he was teaching me to do real estate and then he took took me to go show me how you would buy real estate from people with no money and um th back then I was living in I was grew up in Texas but, but in Texas you could assume uh uh mortgages you can't really do that now but there's ways to do it but you couldn't really do that now but he had taught me on how to go out and find properties and Lo and behold, I've been able to use that my entire life. And there was a period of time where I couldn't invest in real estate, didn't have the money to do it. But when I started to invest in real estate way back from age 17, when I learned where to go and look for properties, it was like, I know where to go find properties. I went to the courthouse. There's a sheet, foreclosures uh banks on most banks will have uh real estate owned sections or you can go to the bank get the real estate owned section and uh that was how we got that property and then other ways you could do probates where a person died and the family members have a property and you can negotiate with them before they even put it on the market there's a property that I'm going to talk about in a future video that I'm selling now that I've owned for six years that I purchased purchased it that way and uh, it was from the three surviving uh, siblings and they were older like in their 50s and 60s their their parents died their their last parent died and they had actually built that house and then uh, when that parent died they wanted to sell it and we negotiated with the three of them to buy the property for cash for sixty five thousand dollars cash bought that property held it and made twelve hundred dollars a month rent on it for six years and now we're selling it and we're selling it now for eighty nine thousand uh, dollars so you can see we made very good money on that property uh, so so that was so the, the ways that you can find properties you can go down to the courthouse see the foreclosure list of properties that are going to be foreclosed you can try to make offers that way or you can see the bank who owns it make offers that way you're, you're usually going to make the lowest get the lowest type deals before they go through a lot of lawyers and all types of uh uh different changing different hands of, or doing think that the, the bank has to do things to maintain the property you're going to be able to get very good deals at that point but not to say that there's not deals out there because a lot of people like even with this property that we're selling a lot of people came to us over investors we had people that came to us that were pretending to be couples you know to buy a house and this is you know if, if you got money this is not really a house that you would be staying in so they uh, they would came to us pretending like they were gonna they want to get the property for them and their family and you can tell that it's they're not really the type of family that would live in that type of property even though it's in a good neighborhood but it's a small house and um, 
Uh, we so we had people come to us that way, and what they the technique that they were going to try to do is they saw that it was a good deal because we did price it way below market value because we had made really front we, when you when we bought the property with the way that we bought it we knew we were going to be profiting a lot of money and that's one of the secrets of buying real estate a lot of your profit is going to be in the way you buy it uh, a lot of people buy real estate they're paying too much money and uh they end up where when they try to sell it it's like they either broke even or they didn't really make much money we bought that property so low that even when we are selling the property we made money those all those years and we're gonna make our money back plus money on top of it with being able to put it on the market below uh, market value because that's gonna get a lot of attention for the property um, but so but people do go and look at properties and then they try to work try to find the situation of the owner and then they try to, uh, uh, you know, negotiate uh, off of the property by, you know, having an inspection, saying these things are wrong with the property, by, uh, you know, talking about the neighborhood, all types of things. They'll try to uh, beat it down so they could try to get the, the property down on the price. But that was so that was how we those are some of the ways that we bought properties and I'll talk about other ones and I'll have some real estate people come in and talk about that too but the big piece of that was the connection like the information that I'm giving you information that was given to me you never know when you're when that connection when that dot is going to connect and uh, when, when I talk about where you have to just be willing to allow things to flow into you uh, and don't get upset don't think that you got to know it all um, is that you just got to allow things to come in and then dots will connect for my uh, YouTube viewer where she, uh, she uh, didn't know what the outcome would be I told her what to do and then now the dot connected and now when she tells that to someone else dots will th that information that I gave her will uh, she could use that forever that dot is connected and then she can pass that on to someone else and 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 if they believe her if they can just listen to to, to her and take a leap of faith that um, the dot will be connected and they'll be able to use that information someday in their life so I want you to put your comments if you haven't subscribed to my channel please subscribe I'm going to get better at making the videos. Uh, I'm really drilling in. And if you look at my history, I've been in business since the age of 20. I started my first company. I'm going to turn 51 years old next month in August, at the end of August, August 29th. And uh, so you, I, all I've done, I, I haven't worked for anyone, anyone since I was 20 years old. Can you believe that? I haven't worked for anyone since I was, since I was 20 years old. So I have a lot of of information that I want to be able to pass down to people uh, to you in my videos because when I wake up in the morning I'm doing exactly what I want to do and yes I want to do more but I know that I, I feel good because I get to come into work in my office building that I purchased and I'm going to talk about this one in a future video but I get to do what I want to do I, when I walk into this building that I own it, it's like a level of comfort because this is like my second home, my office building, where my employees work out of. You know, this this is what I visualized when I was in the United States Army when I went in there at the age of seventeen. I was uh, visualizing how I wanted my life to be, and when I look back, this is exactly what I wanted. My office is even set up the way that I envisioned it when I was in the United States Army. I was like, if I had an office, I wanted it to be set up similar to the way that the captain in the uh, Army was set up. And, and he had someone, the first sergeant was in between him and his office. So you couldn't get to him without going to the first sergeant. So if you, uh, so if you need help or you have questions about credit repair please reach out to us at the credit repair shop .com and post your comments below this video and we will
continue to, uh, or I'll do my best to answer them as quickly as possible. Thank you.